the grace of giving. I want us to read from the book of Mark chapter 14, verse 3, all the way to verse 9 as our basic scripture. This lesson, as I said um, last week, we are recapping part of the lessons we did in Encounter 1, and so it has majority of my sharing from Encounter 1, and some few things that I've twisted and tweaked to be able to share with us. In the book of Mark chapter 14, we want to go through a scripture um, and be able to make some reflections and look at other passages elsewhere and then God will bless us. From verse 3, the Bible says, While he was in Bethany, that is Jesus, reclining at the table in the house of a man known as Simon Peter, the leper, a woman came with, alabaster, with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always help me. She did what she could. She did um, what she could. She poured perfume on my head beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the gospel, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. May the Lord bless his word and open our eyes to understand. So the Bible says, the last passage, that actually the giving of this lady, as much as looks lavish and wasteful, becomes a record to be remembered. And that tells you that actually you can write an epitaph. An epitaph is the writing we do for people when they are dead. I'm saying you write your epitaph before you die a memory through giving. And so this passage brings that. But there are some few other things I want to bring on before I do the introduction. The Bible says, and she broke the flask. It was a quick way of bringing the tithe before the money or the offering, before it was used. Because that flask, because this was a perfume. For many of you who have perfume, I use one, you just press. It works well, it's cost effective. But now, when the love is great, you want to quickly love the Lord. She did it so that she could quickly render her devotion to God. Amen. Some of us need to be struggling and coming. Thank God for Mpesa. That I want to put my offering here. I want to put, this is what she did. Lavish way. Another thing that I want to mention to us is that the Bible talks of her giving a perfume equivalent to a year. Some of the versions say 300 denarii, and the people used to eat a wage of one denarii. So that was a whole year's salary. And that was not a tithe. It was an offering to God. What does that tell us this particular morning? If you look afternoon, if you look at the passage where it's spoken, and the people that were around Jesus knew the places where money was to be given. They say this perfume should have been sold and be given to the needy. That is maybe one only region or reason that many of us know where to give our tithe or our offering. You say this is a needy. But Jesus says no, no, no. He's not saying don't give to the needy. He says I am introducing you to another worship where offering comes to my feet. Amen? That basis, if you get it then, you will understand why some of you would think that this woman did a wasteful thing. Jesus actually says, you will do to the needy any time you want, and I will be exposing your mind why you should also do the same. But for now, there is also a moment for you to worship God lavishly. So today I want to attempt to change. I'm attempting because I don't know whether I will change some of you. You are a little bit maybe rigid, or you know these things. Some of your perceptions that have shaped our understanding, or rather misunderstanding, because there are some of us who have a certain way of thinking about giving, particularly Christian giving. And this is to be able to inspire you towards growth 
and growth on the things of God, being in the presence of God. I'm not in any way telling you that if you give this, you are going to increase your bank account, but you'll increase your faith. Being able to give somebody salary for a year, uh, my friend, that is quite something, okay? In giving tithes, also in offerings and alms. I'll be defining this so don't get worried. In the Old Testament, we see regulated giving. For many of us who have read, you would have your tithe. Instead of us giving offering as seated, many of you are actually to come with your cows, with your donkeys, and that, and you come with them. And it was, in fact, there was another Muse who was interpreting the Old Testament for farmers of maize. You say, is when you are planting the maize, the tenth line, you just leave it, and then the Levites, the pastor, would come and harvest the tenth line. But some of you later on learned the planting without lines, so I realized you just throw, so that you cannot calculate the tenth line. But it was so specific that actually the tenth line was not harvested. The Bible talks about this. Some of you are still planting in scatter method. I know your trick so that we cannot calculate the tenth. The Bible says, and they could not harvest. Because it was maize, the, the orphans would come, the street children would come, and the levers would come. They would just harvest and they go home. And actually the Bible prohibited the levers to work. That was the Old Testament. And also the offering were prescribed. I will not go in that. Maybe next time I get a listen, we we'll look at the Old Testament giving. It's so sweet. If we started now, it would be a very good way so that we don't ask you to, to get maize. You just ask me, come home, calculate your 10%. I come with my donkey. I put my portion. I come here. I give you the receipt. There is no receipt we give people here. I'm just telling you an example. In the New Testament, where we read, we see generous and liberal giving which I'm terming, uh, I've termed the grace of giving. Why would this lady come to Jesus and pour this perfume until the disciples and the teachers of law come and they wonder, they wish to have used this to serve this. They were still in the Old Testament. They didn't know what Jesus, when he came, he actually encouraged generosity, the generous giving of everything. And she does it so quickly. I want to imagine that if the people came and found this lady, actually offering this, they might have actually said, please let me help you to offer. And then in the end, they would have actually misappropriated. In accounts, actually, if you use that which was meant elsewhere, you have misappropriated funds. I know many of you read on the newspapers, and you think it's a big term. For me to use the money that was meant for flowers to buy water is called misappropriation of funds in account. So, this lady would have been accused of misappropriation of the offering by fact that she poured. But Jesus says and affirms, she is okay. She says, let her do, I'm there. So it's a generous kind of thing. And so Jesus actually reinforces the point that I've not abolished the law of us giving to the needy because the needy were always there and they are still there. But that is not a reason why you should not be able to give your offering. Hope you can see that photograph that is on the screen. If it's not on the screen, it should come. Story is told of, um, of two animals, the chicken and the pig, were going to a hotel somewhere uh, in a town. And as they were moving toward the shop, they realized that meal that I put there is being served. And they say, bacon and eggs for breakfast. And then what happens is that the continence of the pig just changes sadly, but the eggs become, the, the, the chicken is very happy. And then the chicken, the, the pig asks the, the, the chicken, why are you so happy? And he says, I am seeing my contributions is on the menu. <laughs> oh, so I'm happy. I'm part of this place. I'm part of this congregation. He said, but why are you sad? And he says, whoa, I see myself on the menu. <laughs> the moral story of this is that times, even in the things of God, some of us just do some contributions, and we are happy to make noise. But for some of us, our lives are on the altar. And so it cannot just be rose. Every time you see, every time you see your friend 
on the menu on the table. You say, I'm next. And so the pig could not be anyway happy to see himself on the altar. It's just a depiction of seeing your own salary coming. I'm telling you, if you've done that done quickly, you cannot be happy. It is something of sacrifice. It's a sign of surrender. In fact, uh, one of the things we learn is, is your whole self in Christ. So you cannot joke when you are served on the menu. But God is inviting us to fully surrender to him with all our lives. Praise the Lord. Be happy. Actually, one of the things I want to change your misconception because I'm also losing you is that you should be happy like the chicken if you are the pig. That is the thing. Amen. <laughs> Our basics about giving is that it is started with God giving himself for Jesus Christ. In the passage we have read, Jesus looked like to be like the pig story. He says, this woman has done to me a celebration for my burial. What he says is, I have been slaughtered beforehand, so I'm on the menu to be eaten. And he's very delighted, actually. So it is God who sacrificed his own son. While many of us could be happy to be Christian, it took Jesus to sacrifice his only son. You know, some of you have sons, but anyway, you never sacrifice any. But if they get lost, it's very painful. Jesus says, this one is mine, this one I give him for the world. So giving started with God through sending Jesus Christ. And so it begins with giving of self. Seeing our, our meat on the altar, you know, one of the things that excites me even is to see even some of these worshipers, they sleep here. They are fully to God. They say, God, I fully surrender to you. And it begins with self. You will never actually give anything unless you are in the Lord. So it begins with giving of yourself, and then you can give your possessions. It is faith in action. We give our time and our resources. When we give, it begins time. Time is money. In fact, men have said that. For many of us to be here, particularly those who serve us in the ashes, those of us who are in worship, elders, they sacrifice their time. And we also sacrifice our resource. It is faith. It is not easy. Some of you are busy. But because of that, you always make time for God. God only delights in an offering when we are right with him. This woman, in the passage you have read, if you are keen, in some place the Bible says, and the leprous woman, she had been healed. And you know, leprosy in the Old Testament was a sign of sin. So it's an equivalent of actually none of us who was born with a dummy, with any of us who was born with sin, going to God and say, God, you have forgiven me. So I acknowledge this and I delight I want to offer something to you. Praise the Lord. So when you are not right with God, I don't know who you give. It is God who you give when you are right with him. What are the types of giving that we want to learn about this morning? One is the 10% called the tithe. The 10% of one's income. It is the minimum we can give to the Lord. It is the starting point. Okay? Tithes are only taken to the church where you worship regularly. A tithe in the right biblical interpretation was the 10% of what you received. And somebody was asking the first service, but I sorry I didn't mention it. It is because you give your whole tithe. Malachi 3.10 says, bring your whole tithe. Just like you are taxed from gross, you give tithe from your gross. You don't tithe from your loans. Your loan is not your money. Before you able to do anything, you look at what you ought to be paid. If you commit yourself to loan, then monthly you budget for your tithe as a whole of the amount you have, not the net after care. Care taxes you gross. And that is how God, because the Bible says, bring the whole tithe to God. Did Jesus reinforce tithe? Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, we can turn there. The Bible says this in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. What to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, um, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters 
of law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So even where we read when Jesus talks about helping the needy, which is justice and mercy, Jesus actually comes so clearly in his word, which we believe as a Bible-believing church, that we can actually practice both the giving of our tithe and the helping of the needy. And I'll be looking at that. Actually, that takes us to what we give offering. Giving out of free will. Once you give your tithe, you can give the offering to God out of your free will. And you give as much as you want, as much as God has enabled. The other giving is called alms. Now, this is the giving of needy, which does not replace the giving of tithe. Jesus says you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So you can't say that I have been struggling with my pastor in my rural village and these things that um, I should cut part of my tithe and be giving them. Some of you say, maybe because this church is here, it's not doing something. You think that you keep part of your tithe and then it becomes you dispensing the tithe. The tithe is brought in the house of God. But when you give what you do to the needy, you do what we call giving of alms, giving to special groups of people, and that is a blessing. I've seen even some missionaries say they need to tithe to certain places. I know some countries, people tithe to mission organization. But the biblical way is that you should be able to go to the sending church, and then the sending church dispenses the money to the missionary, and the missionary appropriate the money in the work of God. The rest is arms, what we call the mission support that you give beyond that. There is something else which I want us to also look at. It's called faith giving. This is giving of pledges, where many of you have already pledged and say, I want to give to so and so because they are waiting. I want to give to so and so. I want to give to this project. It is a commitment in faith. You don't have it. In Paul, when he was going to the Corinthian church, and they say that we will keep for you something. And Paul was moving around collecting. They first of all promised him something. And so he was coming to collect letters. It was a faith giving. So when he comes to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 or chapter 10, and he sees some of you have given more than your ability. Why was that being commended? It's because they promised to give. And maybe when he was going there, he didn't imagine he would collect what he was collecting. It's called a pledge. But be careful when you give a pledge because that is supposed to be honored. Otherwise, you'll be called a lie. In fact, before I go far, one of the things I needed to actually let you know that while we give offering, alms, and faith, in tithe, we pay tithe. You pay tithe because it was regulated. So I should not emphasize that. There is giving of in kind, which I've mentioned earlier on, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, God talks about he will not neglect our work. When we are in ministry, we are giving in kind. For many of us who don't know, you may not even people think that you give offering. By fact, you can come in this place and pray in the morning. You are actually giving to God in kind. Many of us who serve God, like us, except my pastors here and our security at the gate, and one single person in the sound room, even this one here who's taking camera is a volunteer, my secretary and my father, the rest are volunteers, including the deacon. They volunteer, they give themselves to kind. And sometimes I feel when I demand, I demand meetings from them, they are volunteering, they are giving in kind. They are giving their resources. They are giving their time to God, and that also God calls it giving. There's also donating of property. We thank God that you can actually donate property. You can bring a ship. I was in a wedding and somebody like, didn't like the gift of a ship. And the ship, two ships were brought. And when they brought them, she said, remove this one. It's now no marash. You know, it was affecting the old one. But no, to me, I would have received it with thanksgiving. God accepts us when we give our property. It could be a property from our flock and all that. And we thank God, even this place. I think we have ever had one portion of land here. We are hoping to put up something. For many of you are coming in you. We also receive title deeds, clean title deeds. They come, we receive them with thanksgiving. Amen. Hey, somebody's thinking now, those are big things. We have ever received from among you 
think I've seen one title lead the nation. And we thank God. You can give in kind to the work of God. You can give your car. Amen. Good car. Good car, not the one written off. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm looking at my pastor so that you don't think that I'm looking at you. In tithes, I've already mentioned, when you talk about tithes, we are asked to give an offering of what we bring. And this is, it has to be given to us. Uh, we know we give tithes out of what God has given unto us. Even in the New Testament, we see that tithe is referenced, and we do that without neglecting anything that we want to do, like mercy, justice, and other giving. <clears throat> I want us to look at some selected giving in the New Testament to reinforce the grace of giving. Because the grace of giving, if you like it, our elder Lactabai said last time, generosity in giving. We see this woman where we have read an alabaster jar of oil. That is actually a generous giving, equivalent to a year's salary. In short, she gave 100%. There are things you can practice. I know some of you just giving a year. If you have saved for last year, it's OK. I'm not saying you give beyond ability. But are some of you who can actually give a year's salary and you still live well. This is, amen. I'm not saying you do it, because there is somebody who gave offering. I don't know where I was dreaming or I was counseling long time, I can't remember. After giving everything to the house of God, and he comes and says, pray for me. They say, I don't have fare to go home. Now, that is not wisdom. <laughs> Amen? I'm teaching you this so that you'll be open how to calculate and what you do. Because that looked like a test. So you need to go. Just go and take the offering again and say, go and do your mathematics again and hear God well and come. And come. This woman had no regrets for pouring the alabaster jar of oil because she knew what she was doing. She had fair home. She had food for the year. Amen? I'm not doubting God. What I'm saying is, don't go and do something. Then you stand and say, what I had, I've given to God. So I want fair to go home. If I have ability and the money has not gone, I'll just take that money and give you back to go and pray. And then you come back when you have made your mind very well. But it's possible for you to give in that particular way. Zacchaeus, chapter, uh, Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, I would also want us to read, so I'm not quick. Um, let's turn to Luke 19. He also does a certain kind of giving. It's in the Old Testament. And the Bible says in verse 8 of Luke 19 that there was a man called Zacchaeus. But Zacchaeus stood up and says to, God, to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I pay back four times the amount. This is giving in the New Testament. For some of us, actually the people, the proponent who are against the tithe, they think that when the tithe is removed, then I become free of giving. The Old Testament actually reinforces higher. Zacchaeus does half. Half is 50% of the possessions. So he did have this lady. And that is also a generous giving. The widow's offering. The Bible says, and Jesus sat when the people were bringing offering. And a certain widow came and put two copper coins. When Jesus looked at that and knew how this woman lived and worked, he said, this has given out of poverty. Seemed like this lady had given everything she had earned for that particular day. That is grace of giving. The giving that goes beyond. Actually, for many people who read the Bible, for you to get to the place where you enjoy generosity, you will enjoy the gift of giving. For some of us who don't enjoy the gift of giving, one thing that I recommend to you is you can only give tithe. Because the gift of giving, there are people here who are givers. You have seen the mother who gives the children the food and then he, she sits back. Now that is a gift of giving. There are people who love giving. They can give in faith. And that is a grace. And this is where this woman is, and they lacked not, nothing. The early believers in Acts chapter 2, verse 45, the Bible said that they sold their properties, and they brought everything, and they ate together, and none of them lacked anything. They actually did the act of generosity, the act of enjoying the grace of sharing all that they had. 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, which I didn't read, but you can read later on, chapter 9, and this, we see people giving according to ability, beyond ability. What we are trying to do even in the men's project is that you can give according to ability. If I was a good charismatic preacher, I would have counted your number and I said, we want to 50,000, everyone give 1,000. But some of us, 1,000 is, is difficult. But for some of us, actually, we can give 10,000. We can give 20,000. We can give 100,000. Actually, people can give that amount of money. Praise the Lord. Yeah, you know, when I say this, you say, you pastor, I've come. I'm teaching you this. You will care to the place of understanding. An anonymous person came when we had put this carpet. And, you know, I announced, and then later on I was prompted that it was not coming quickly, and we did money from the budget to do this. So somebody came later and he said, I also wanted to be part of this. I said, you are late. You are late. And uh, the person said, uh, so how can I be the part of this? I said, also I wanted to put a carpet in my office. My carpet in the office costed me over 90,000, but it was done by somebody who came late when I wanted to do this. So it's very possible that actually one person can do the work. I know some of my elders didn't know that carpet was done by one person. Somebody came late. We had already finished this work. So when actually this happened, they came, I said, okay, what do you want to do? And say, now, um, I also wanted to be part of this. That's how I ended up to be having a carpet in my office, the best quality of ever to be there. I didn't desire. We had finished everything here. It is possible to give according to ability. No one would force you, and you can do it. Even the car park there, it can be done by one person. Can I hear amen? amen. 250,000, it can be done by one. It's possible, but rush and get your blessings. Amen. It's possible, actually. I can dare tell you. I can give you an example here and there, but what I'm emphasizing here is it is not the value. I'm not mentioning the value to scare you. Neither am I not mentioning the value, not to give you opportunity. See opportunity and do according to your ability. How should we give? We should be motivated by God's example of God's giving and by our love for Christ. This woman came to Christ and I think she said, I have been saved. I should do this. It should not be motivated actually by this preaching. This is supposed to be a teaching. Oh, Lord, help me that I just teach these things slowly. It's not supposed to motivate you. Praise the Lord. One as we son. So that we get the place that you actually love God and do his work for the work of his kingdom. We should be guided by the, proportion, the principle of proportionate giving, using the tithe as a beginning model to assure the growth in giving. So you begin from tithe. For many of us who are new believers, try to, as much as you can, to ask God, have I paid my tithe? That is the beginning point. Am I growing in things beyond that? So that we don't end up in a place, somebody said, that those who give tithe, sometimes we, we become so legalistic, so we don't have money. So you know I paid tithe. I have no other extra. When, G, when Paul was walking around the churches, we see that people were giving differently. For many of us, we are not in the same level. We have begun. And so God grows you. You should also proportionately increase your worship. One of the things we are saying this year in his presence, and I pray that God helps you to understand, we want you to grow in fellowship. 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 You ask yourself every day, do I belong to a fellowship, a WM small group? Do I belong in an SG group? Do I belong in men's group? Fellowship, to be in his presence. Another thing that we, is prayer. You communicating with God every day. But that will not come with also seeing the way you give your time and resources to God. For David said, I will not give to God that cost me nothing. So as you grow every day, grow in the area of giving. You grow your tithe. The tithe grows automatically because it's a percentage. Your offering also grows. So that now when you're at the level, a certain level, you also say, um, uh, I'll do this. Praise the Lord. I've managed to work with some pastors elsewhere. But I met some few bishops. When you sit with the bishops, my friend, I love some of them. They, they know giving. They don't give like the back page. When you sit with them, you remove your wallet. You know what you need to do. In, uh, sometimes now I'm sitting with them. They teach you because they are bishops, you know. We were actually giving an offering towards the dedication of this county. 
I had to ask because I'm benevolent for my pastor for almost to be equal to them. We sat on the table and said, this is our county. And I saw senior bishop and say, we are church fathers. This event is ours. And I would see a note. Yeah, and they say the senior pastor of Edward should sit with us. But I learned from the church fathers that when you are a church father, you don't behave like those who sit at the back. Growth, praise the Lord. When position grows you, ask God that now you know the places to go. You need to go and watch the movie, The Lion, the King. I will preach. I have ever given you the example. When you are a lion now, you know where you sit and what you do in the matter of worship. Amen? We should be cheerful. Even managers, when people are contributing in Arambes, when manager, wanatoa miambili, wacha kutoa miambili. Praise the Lord. Amen. We should be cheerful to direct his gift to serve God's purposes. One of the things we pray here is when God gives us what he has given, it should serve God's purpose. So sometimes the problem with us is to think that it's not serving God's purpose because it has been poured to the feet. It looked like a sacrifice. Even I know some of us who think that this was a waste, but nowadays people are lying there. It's a beautiful thing. The place of God should be beautiful. It should be magnificent. Praise the Lord. Because beauty is expensive. Have you ever gone to a place of place that made a good garden? You pay for it to be there. So God enjoys his presence in this place, in the name of So it should serve God's purpose, so that you don't look like now you have wasted this. You should have gone to the needy, because you know the needy will have food. All our gifts that we do to God must serve God's purposes. We should channel, channel the gift through the shared fellowship of the church. This is not supposed just to be done on the streets. So I have seen you, Pastor, this is offering. That's why we give you opportunity to worship together. And it's a moment for us to worship. Just like the word of God, we actually give you 15 minutes. For many of you, I've never 10 to 15 minutes to worship God with your substance. For you to prayerfully say, God, it's time to give, it's time to be blessed. It's do it in a church setting. And that's why we say the tithe is in a fellowship where you belong. It's not done elsewhere. When we do it elsewhere, you are doing alms. You have given me something because I'm your friend, so I've eaten your lunch. But that is not a gift to God. It's an alm you have given. So we do our giving in a fellowship of a church. Sit them elderly, sit them as a whole, and that is a blessing to God. We should give with joy and gratitude. We should not actually be like the pig. Well, that was just an example. The food was to be eaten. But you know, we thank God that when our offering went to him, he received it. In the Bible says, there was sweet aroma. Actually, the lamp, when it was offered to God on the altar, it was burned, and the aroma would go to God. What does that mean? You must do it cheerfully. Okay, as much as we struggle, because giving and prayer, those are the few things that people struggle. We do well in fellowship. That is good. Two things that Christians struggle, prayer and giving. Two, two things. Here, actually, during our prayer meeting, we are normally just around six rows from here. I can tell you maybe the same computation can be true for giving. But God is telling us something. Amen. We give anticipating that our gift will be used to achieve divine purposes, not to receive back. We don't give, like people have said, now do ten. This is not a betting game. We give to God because he has given to us. So you do it as an offering. When you receive, it is showing that you actually be blessed. I gave an example in the first service. I buy chocolates for my daughters. But if you take all of it and bite each give. You see the way they are angry. It's me who has bought the chocolate. And you know chocolates are very expensive, actually. So you, you buy it. They don't feel good. But who is the buyer of the chocolate? The father. And the father, akiuma tukidogo even, the akupati, una katrika. And so they rotate there. If you are a good parent, go and attempt home this week. Take again and buy it more. You see them rolling if they are greater than me. <laughs> this is the thing here. That... We have a place where that we are anticipating to receive. I want us to go to the biblical understanding of giving the New Testament. Time is gone. The individual's gift is to begin with self. I've said that you cannot give to God until you're in him. Actually, many times we struggle. It's because we are still in our flesh. When you learn giving, it will be just like raising up the hand. You just be the way we come here and we pour ourselves to God. It begins with ourselves, giving our lives to Christ, giving yourself to God. And you see, it's not a waste to be. Actually, you no, know, Paul says, 
that salvation is like foolishness to many of us who believe. You know, sometimes when you realize somebody giving their 20,000, 30,000, 100, that was the worst. But it is because they have given themselves to Christ. The gift is for personal response. It's voluntarily. It's not to be forced that now do this, this will happen. When you do whatever you want to do, Jesus said you will be able to. In fact, Jesus did not answer some question related to these things because he expected people to know. He actually understood they knew that the tithe was non-negotiable. So when he went to other matters, he would only explain to them and leave them. Why was he doing that? He wanted them to know it as a personal responsibility. You will never actually get us, even as a church, as a follower of the Bible, coming to you and say, you didn't pay tithe. But I've seen even some denominations, when you die and you have not fulfilled your tithe obligation, there is a minimum you need to do and the pastor comes. For me, I will just come. In fact, I will not ask you whether you tithe. I will just be there. We will do that group music we normally do and thank God and pray for you and we go. It is your personal responsibility and that should also be able to strike you as you're talking about in his presence. There are things you're supposed to do as an individual. The believer is to reflect the response to the grace of God working in his life. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, you know, you can be able to um, look at the grace of God. But look at even that woman in that place. She, the only one knew why she would give an alabaster jar full of oil. Because she knew what God had done for them. For many of us, actually, God has done great things for us. We have no reason to not thank God. You started a job with nothing. Some of you are volunteers, and God has blessed you. Don't see that this is too much expectation. Grow in the grace of God. There is a growing in grace. Somebody preached about grace, that grace is able to lift you up. So the greater you are for things, you do greater things. The grace. Some bishops call them, them his grace. You know those churches? When you get at a place, they call them his grace. So they are walking in a certain dispensation whereby the grace is great. So don't just remain in the same place year after year is your 50 bob or 100 bob. I'm not saying 100 bob is But God is lifting you. You are his grace, the bishop. His grace. He anointed. This should teach you something in terms of this. You response. Look at what God has done to you. Give thanks to God and say, God, I was sick, I'm here. Now this is an offering to you. May I live more that I may worship you more. Should be a desire to walk in his person. The examples of Christ giving is a guide to a Christian. I've mentioned that. The giver is sure to concern of human needs. Jesus says that you will always have the needs and please, after this, go and do whatever you do. But now, allow the alabaster jar of oil be poured to me. So he's saying there are human needs there. So our giving should also show concern of human needs. So don't think that we are negligent of that. As a church, we have anticipated every first Sunday of every month, we do the appeal for mass basket. That helps some of us who don't have anything to eat, they have something that they can be able to share. And we want the house of God to always have something. So when pastor is here and somebody is coming and he's saying, I don't have anything to eat, be happy. Actually, they told the, the visitation ministers and SG, somebody came to my office and I had been served tea. It was about 11. I had not taken tea. And the person says, ah, pastor, first of all, give me tea. You know, we get all kinds of, give me tea. So I had to ask Beatrice, our sector, to go and serve the person tea. Then they finish, then they come. And truly, the person was hungry. We meet their needs. Now, I chai in satan or There was tea. I think I was busy. And also, lunch had come. It had been served. But the person was very categorical. He says, Pastor, can I have your tea and your mandaz? Our giving should meet needs. So, so we cannot actually over-spiritualize the needs that are among our people. We seek to meet them as God enables us. The gift is to be a concrete. A concrete means it's a love. It's a love for each other. I was watching comedy. I hope this will not be misquoted. Um, the, this comedian, Jugush, on Valentine, had a gift of phone to the girlfriend. But it was a good box of a good phone. No, the box of a phone. But inside there was no phone. There was a Bible, a small Bible. So they laughed with the person they were doing comedy. 
And then when the lady opened, he said, oh, this is what she was angry. Well, it was comedy. But the lesson is, it was fake. It was fake. When we give God and opens our tight envelopes, is it a concrete laugh? Go and watch that episode. That young man knows how to joke. And I laughed because love was not expressed the way this man and this person. I have a phone, I have a phone. And they opened. There was this small free Bible of Gideon's in that particular box. And the girl <laughs> laughs and he goes in. It was not concrete. While that is a joke from that young man. But sometimes we do comedy with God when we are giving our tithe, when we are giving offering. And he opens and he says, oh, this is it. I should not emphasize this. The gift should be proportionate. I've said this of your material possessions. I should not. What are the benefits of giving? The Bible says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, that test me and see if I will not open the heavens. While many people misquote this concept to make the prosperity teaching, it is the only passage in the Bible where God asks us to test him in giving. I want to tell you this biblically true that God asks us to test him. For many of us actually who want financial breakthrough, the solution is finance. So don't cry more. Your money, it's not your money, God's money with you, <laughs> must start to be fellowshipping. There is that connectedness that needs to be done. Some of you are good keepers of money because Someone taught us that there's a difference between keeping money and saving money. So I'm saying some of you are good keepers of money. You have kept even the old notes that is already obsolete. It's in yourself. You have kept it very well. You don't want anything. But if you make it circulation, it gets value. It gets value. It gets value. So God actually invites us to test us in that area. And it's very biblically right for him, even me to teach you. Those of us who are seeking financial breakthrough this year, it's good I like laying hands. This is the small altar call. Learn to be able to allow God to be part of your money. The danger is this. For many of us, we have idolized money. So we feel like even giving somebody, some of you are mean even, you have idolized money. So for God to remove idolatry of money from you, he must teach you, and you, and you, and me, to actually offer something to him. It's his money, but you have taken it so jealously that you can. So he said, test me, because the devourer is eating our money. You know, you have so much a lot. Because some of you think, Majin can come and take your money. I have never seen them take my money. But some of you lose money from your account that night. Anyway, Kunawakora, who knows password. But truth be said, faithfulness in the things of God will give you financial breakthrough. For some of you, you want to be in the financial, financial breakthrough. Even if it's a hundred book, just be faithful. Go ahead and give God your ten book. Financial breakthrough. It is not prayer. There is an albasta I do here. That one, no, 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 no they cannot. Giving and tithing honors God, uh, that's a benefit. We don't do it for ourselves. We do it to honor God. One of the things we don't declare who gave what. These are secret and we know it's for God. And that ends there. That is the good thing of being here. And it is because it honors God in, your, in, in where he sits. It brings joy and fulfillment. For many of you who are good givers, you'll always realize it's good. Um, I know I, sometimes people buy for me soda. You, you feel good when you take that soda. Particularly free soda, <laughs> Elder Philip. <laughs> Pam is good. Um, it's joyful to give. Both the giver and the receiver. It's supposed to be that. Do you receive it and say, ah, good. Have you ever received an MPS? I don't expect. Oh, you have remembered me. Uh, it's, it's a fulfillment, and you feel good. And some people feel it good. In fact, uh, people who are always struggling where to give, you know. I had one friend of mine and said, where can I give? Hi. I need these questions in this church. When we give, we receive back. Actually, it is in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. But giving should, not be an giving should be an expression of worship rather than a desire for prosperity. Because when you read in Proverbs, you say, whoever lends to others will be able to get something. So that should not be. But there are likely circumstances that when you give, and that is you receive back. 
and you give this way, it comes. That's why I'm going breakthrough. It's something that you can do. I should not emphasize. But don't give to receive back because if you don't receive back, you know God, you know I looked at when Jesus was doing miracles. Jesus himself, he would get ten lepers, he heals one and he goes. Jesus himself, live life. It's the same thing with our offering. Sometimes some of you receive instant breakthrough. Others is a spiritual foundation for things to come. So don't give desire. Just do it. But there's a possibility that when you give to God, you receive. What are the areas you can give apart from your tithes and offering? It's a reflection. At least men and women have put a project for you. Think and respond appropriately. Practical ways of giving. You can give to the mission, to the orphans, the widows, even members of your family. Budget for them and do, do something. You can do a dustbin in this place. We are going to have our 10th anniversary. Come and see what we have not seen. And they say, I want to be part of this in the name of Jesus. In fact, we are not appealing. But because I'm teaching you this early, you can start thinking. Because we are going to have a big event. Actually, we need a double tent. Because we do one service that day. And we are having the whole country here. That means that we need faith giving. Amen? We we'll try to budget from our own. Because I don't want to disturb you. But God can touch you through this teaching. That you can become a parcel of this. You bring us two cameras. You can bring us a carpet. You can come and help us with ideas, even advertisement. That will be something that you need to do on 17th of September. You need to be committed to giving as a lifestyle. I should not emphasize this. Giving should not be one time. Why tithes, why you receive your salary every day? It's because you need to worship God continually. As God prospers you, you go before God and you sacrifice something. We need a paradigm shift from ourselves and be able to give knowing his love and his grace. When you understand this, you'll always give from the point of information that God has saved me and is leading me. I want to conclude and say that giving is a delightful worship experience. It's a way to be in his presence. It's a thing that you can desire for every believer. In fact, of every age, okay? Whenever we give our resources, somebody say this to God or to Father, we cast a ballot. We do a ballot to God when we actually give to his work. And again is certain. For heaven and again is hell. But when we don't do that, we are actually casting a ballot for certain. I pray that we choose if we are of God. Let's not eat at each other <laughs> in this manner. And I pray God will bless us. Amen.